Welcome. This review material will focus on the basics of kinetics, deducing a rate law via the method of initial rates, and deducing a rate law by the linearization of concentration time data for first, second, and zero order reactions, so that ultimately a mechanism can be hypothesized. The study of kinetics mainly focuses on experimentally deducing a rate law so that a mechanism for a reaction of importance can be hypothesized. Within these reviews, we will focus on the differential and integrated rate laws. Which method the scientist chooses depends on what kind of data can be collected. For example, maybe it is easier to study how the rate of a reaction is changed by changing concentrations of reactants. Or maybe it is easier to monitor how concentrations change per time. Either way, a rate law can be deduced. A rate law will have a rate constant and the order for each reactant, and both need to be experimentally determined. In this review, we will limit our discussions to only zero first and second order reactions when dealing with the integrated rate law. Often, when studying kinetics, the student can forget arguably the main purpose of this topic. Experimentally determine a rate law so one can hypothesize a mechanism. The rest of this review video will focus on experimentally deducing a rate law via the method of initial rates. In this example, our goal will be to experimentally determine the rate constant, K, and the order of each reactant, N and M. This will be accomplished by examining the data of three different experiments. Within the data, one can see that concentrations of reactants were changed so that the experimentalist can determine how the initial rates were affected. If we examine the data from experiment 2 and experiment 1, we see that the concentration of ammonium was kept constant and the concentration of nitrite was doubled, which did have an effect on the initial rate. Mathematically, we can examine the ratio of these two experiments to determine what effect doubling the concentration of nitrite had on the rate of reaction. After a few simplifications, we see that M is equal to 1, which is to say nitrite is first order within this reaction. Examining the data from experiment 3 and experiment 2, we see that the concentration of nitrite was kept constant and the concentration of ammonium was doubled this time, which again had an effect on the initial rate. After some simplifications of this ratio, we see that N is equal to 1, which is to say ammonium is first order within this reaction. We can now write our rate law with the order for each reactant. While this may not look like something important or even relevant, it will be very meaningful when hypothesizing a mechanism in later reviews. Now let's deduce the rate constant by substituting data from experiment 1 into our rate law. We can now rewrite our experimentally deduced rate law with the rate constant and the order for each reactant. It should be noted that the exponents, the order, were experimentally determined. In other words, M and N were determined experimentally. They were not obtained from the stoichiometric coefficients of the balanced equation. Although sometimes the experimentally determined order and stoichiometric coefficients of the balanced equation may match, as is the case in this example, but remember, this is just a coincidence. An alternative and much easier way to deduce order for each reactant is to simply inspect the data table. When the concentration of ammonium is constant and the concentration of nitrite doubles, the rate also doubles, which means first order with respect to nitrite. Next, when nitrite is constant and ammonium is doubled, the rate also doubles, which means first order with respect to ammonium. The rate law can now be written, and the rate constant deduced using the data from experiment 1. Clearly, it is much easier to write the rate law by simply inspecting the data. So let's try this method of inspection in the next example. Similar to the last problem, our goal will be to experimentally determine the rate constant K and the order of each reactant, N and M, by simply examining the data of three different experiments. So, if the concentration of mercury 2 chloride is constant and the concentration of oxalate is doubled, the rate quadruples, 
which indicates second order with respect to oxalate. Next, when oxalate is constant and mercury 2 chloride is doubled, we see that the rate also doubles, which means first order with respect to mercury 2 chloride. The rate law can now be written and the rate constant deduced using the data from experiment 1. Now let's prove this result mathematically. Examining the data from experiment 2 and experiment 1, the ratios of these two experiments simplify and then simplify again so that n is equal to 2, which is to say oxalate is second order. Examining the ratio from experiment 2 and 3, we see that the ratios of these two experiments simplify and then simplify again so that m is equal to 1, which is to say the reaction is first order with respect to mercury 2 chloride. As we have done before, the rate law can now be written and the rate constant deduced using the data from experiment 1, which matches the result when the problem was solved by simple inspection. In the next example, we have three reactants and data from four experiments. Thus our goal is to determine L, M, and N, as well as the rate constant, and we will accomplish this by the method of inspection. If the concentrations of bromide and protons are constant, and the concentration of bromite is doubled, we see that the rate doubles, which indicates first order with respect to bromate. Next, when the concentrations of bromate and protons are held constant, and the concentration of bromide is doubled, we see that the rate also doubles, which means first order with respect to bromide. Lastly, when the concentrations of bromate and bromide are both held constant and the concentration of protons is doubled, we see that the rate quadruples, which indicates second order with respect to protons. The rate law can now be written, and using the data from experiment 1, the rate constant can be deduced. The units for the rate constant can get a bit cumbersome, as this example demonstrates. Rewriting the rate law with the rate constant now completes this exercise. However, one additional question you may be asked is, well, what is the overall order? You simply add the exponents, which represents the reaction order for each reactant, and the overall order for the reaction is determined. Again, it is worth mentioning that the exponents, the orders, were experimentally determined. In other words, L, M, and N were determined experimentally and were not obtained from stoichiometric coefficients, which are quite different within this example. In summary, the method of initial rates is simply to change the concentration of a reactant while keeping the concentration of other reactants constant, if necessary, and observe how the initial rate is affected. This allows the experimentalist to deduce the order of that reactant, which affords the rate law. As we mentioned previously, we will use the experimentally determined rate law to hypothesize a mechanism in future reviews. In addition, it is important to note that once product concentrations begin to increase, that reverse reactions may occur. Thus, we study the reaction when the reverse reaction can be neglected. Then the reaction rate will only depend on the concentration of the reactants. <laughs>